five days in to Pacers free agency. What is the state of the team and their process at this point of the offseason in terms of basketball, in terms of team building, and in terms of where they go next? we got to get into all of it from a rotation perspective to a money perspective, all on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers. As always, my name is Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today, uh, if you're watching or listening and it sounds different, hello from Illinois. I'm on the road for some 4th of July fun, but had to get something out. Free agencies rolling. People have interests to get to. The first day here, consecutive days, I suppose, with no Pacers news or signing. Some ex-Pacers on the move uh, recently, but no Jalen Smith, no James Wiseman, no Obi, no nothing as we hit day five. So I want to do a state of the situation for the Pacers, both from a basketball perspective and a financial perspective, to kind of show what if the next steps happen, what they would look like. And then I want to wrap up with other moves I like and ex-Pacer updates. And then next week we can kind of transition from – what they have done to what they could actually do, whether that's other finances and trade stuff. I'll do more trade stuff next week. Looking ahead at next year, because that's one of the big storylines to me of what's happened this offseason. And then, of course, Summer League is coming right up. The The day this comes out, I believe, is the first day of Pacers minicamp uh, for Summer League. So you'll get updates from Johnny Furphy, other draft picks. You'll hear from Jarris. So that'll be a lot to talk about as well. Uh, as the Pacers progress into off-season play. But today, speaking of the off-season, we must talk more free agency topics. And I want to start with the roster, the team that the Pacers actually are. It sounds so simple when you just look at the, the – they haven't done a ton of like big-picture movement kind of stuff, right? A key thing about Pascal was their whole starting five is back, right? You could point to last year in the postseason, even the regular season, and say – Tyrese Halliburton, Andrew Nemhard, Aaron Neesmith, Pascal Siakam, Miles Turner, all back. Great. They very rarely in the regular season had that group all together fully healthy, although they had all of it for most of the postseason. What's the natural next step for that group? Who knows? They have it all back to figure it out for a while. And the bench group with the re-signing of Obi Toppin is all back. It will look different. They had very little overlap of this specific five in terms of who the backup five was and when Matherin got hurt and when trades happened with Buddy Heald going out, but McConnell, Matherin, Ben Shepard, Obi Toppin, and Isaiah Jackson all under contract next year. So rotationally, free agency hasn't actually changed a ton. If anything, no new talent has come in, and that speaks to kind of the limited resources they have. It would have required a trade, most likely, and that still could happen. It's still, who knows? It's July 5th for Pete's sake, but that reality makes sense to me. What is different is everything behind that, right? Last year, for example, you know, as we sat here on July 5th, the key guys who were like the the 11th men, for lack of a better term, the players who would play if if there was an injury were like Jordan Wara, for example, right? And he actually played. He was he was in that mix early in the season as somebody who would come in if there was an injury at like two, three, or four on the team. Buddy Heald was a reserve who would come in in those situations before he got traded, right? Daniel Tice was the reserve five. And I only bring that up to say, and then when they made trades, it became McDermott. A well, key difference is, people have talked about this a lot, what, the where Jarris is going to play could be, he is now the guy, if there's an injury, probably two through five, he could be the first guy who gets minutes to play. But I that, that natural uh, transition to me is, the three guys who are next up for minutes, if you look at the Pacers and, and their rotation, would be James Wiseman, uh, probably as the, the third center, Johnny Furphy, who who knows what his natural position is going to be right now. It's probably the three because he's too small to guard for us. And Jairus Walker, whose natural position is the four. That's a lot of young, inexperienced dudes. And it's fine that they should play and get experience and get better. But that is still some rickety grounds if you have an injury to one of your top ten. Now you're, you're going to survive with nine if you're the Pacers. You found that out a lot of ways last year. But I think that's an important distinction in their rotation from last year to this year at this time. And their 14th guy is Kendall Brown who at the three or the four to me would be behind Furphy or Jairus Walker. So there's not really a path to minutes for him in general on this team, even though he is only 20, whatever, one years old. You know, what's the situation where he is the choice for them to play? There really isn't one 
So I kind of have him on a fourth unit off to the side by himself with with whoever the two ways end up being. So that's the roster reality. And I only bring all that up to say, if you're going to look at what the Pacers could do in free agency, the first thing I would say is they don't really have a, for lack of a better term, third unit ball handler, right? Someone who could come in if there were too many injuries to guards or if they just, in general, weren't getting enough ball handling from their groups. Now, obviously with Tyrese Halliburton, Andrew Nemhard, Pascal Siakam, Ben Mather, and McConnell, that's enough. That's clearly enough. Specifically, I'm talking about guards, someone who is small enough with the low center of gravity to defend other guards. Um, and they they have enough guys who can handle that too, but not enough who can both do that and handle the ball. So in theory, you could think about, if you're the Pacers, another ball handler type. Like Buddy Heald is the emergency point guard last year. They had Wong on a two-way, so maybe they could just have it be a two-way player. They didn't lose any ball handlers from last year, but if you kind of look at and build out their rotations, Quentin Jackson assumed – kind of the spot last year. Bruce Brown was in the mix at times. Maybe you could say if they wanted to add a 15th guy, they could add a ball handler because they don't have anyone naturally there. But Jarris Walker can handle it. You know, I don't, I wouldn't say that's a concern or something they need to address, but it does kind of stand out if you sort everybody positionally by units. The other thing I would say looking at this team is they are hope, I think they're going to be a good shooting team. Tyrese Halliburton himself is a good shooter. When he's on the floor, his teammates are good shooters. That in tandem leads to good shooting. I don't think they're going to be a poor shooting team. But they're relying on a lot of guys who have had good shooting seasons but are not necessarily proven shooters to be good three-point shooters. Aaron Neesmith, you know, he had a great year last year shooting, but that was his first one. Andrew Nemhard has had up-and-down shooting through his career. Siakam and Turner the same way. McConnell is a low-volume guy. Matherin has had one Good shooting year. Ben Shepard, despite looking like a shooter, doesn't really have the percentages to go with it. Obi Toppins had one good shooting year. I think they'll be a good shooting team because they have Halbert. But I wonder if they could get a 15th player that can just shoot. And it, it's rare to have something like that. Uh, like Bug McDermott is kind of this, but you know it's a little different because he would not play right next year. Uh, if you look at you know, the additions of Furphy and, and, and Jarris Walker still existing, it's different what, what McDermott's role would actually look like. But like a, a a shooter who just would not play unless they absolutely needed it. I don't even know if that such a player truly exists. But like Svi Mikhail Luke, maybe you know if he doesn't re up with the uh, with the Celtics, but just something of that vein would make sense to me. In case you are in need of an emergency shooter or like someone you're confident is is fine to just let one fly if they come in for a bench group, Gallinari maybe, but he probably expects minutes. Something like that makes sense to me from a roster perspective. So as you look at that part of it. I think that's a very uh, uh, important thing to me to look at is how do they balance this out? Because there are two guys who I think would be first in line for minutes, should there be an injury, are two very recent draft picks who are unproven, and that's Jarris Walker and Johnny Furphy. And I think that's fine if you're the Pacers as you're trying to kind of make sure you take a step forward but also develop your guys. But there's going to be injuries, right? There's going to be that reality. And so how they blend that together is kind of the next thing. So as they look forward in free agency, it would not surprise me if they found a way to get a veteran in the door still. It's going to be tricky, and we'll ex- I'll explain why in about two, three minutes. But I think, look, if you just sort everybody into buckets on the roster, it does seem kind of like eh, there's like small needs here and there, and yet they can still be confident in this team given how the postseason went last year, postseason, excuse me, went last year, the timing of trades, all sorts of stuff like that. So uh, I think that's where I think they are from a roster perspective. It's fine. It all makes sense. They're top 10 fits really well together. They have young guys ready for minutes. They have new intrigue in Wiseman, but there could be a little bit of steadiness, I would say, required from their third unit. And there are other ways to get it other than just adding somebody straight up. They might have to get a little creative, though. I'm going to explain why in the second segment as we run through the financial status of the Pacers currently in free agency accounting time. Push your nerdy glasses up. Some of you hate this stuff, so if you do, skip to the third segment. If not, you're going to learn a lot, and you're going to see why Kendall Brown might actually be the key to the next steps of the Pacers before we get to any of that, though. We've got to talk about eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. Plus, with eBay's guaranteed fit, 
Your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusion supply. eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Back here on Locked On Pacers as the AC kicks on in my hotel room. Hope it's not too loud or distracting. Thanks for making us your first listen today. And every single day or second listen, Locked On Knicks to hear about the Mikael Bridges trade expanding. Do not hard cap the Knicks. Maybe they can keep Precious Achua. Maybe they can use their tax mid-level exception. Lots of stuff the Knicks can now do that I find very interesting. Locked On Knicks will be better at breaking that all down. Um, let's see. A lot of interesting transactions. Just <laughs> go find a transaction you like listening to Locked On podcast and you'll learn more about it that is how i have been keeping up with a lot of these free agency moves that i don't get actually is uh going to that specific team and figuring it out so back here in pacer land financially it's tight right that's a big bit of theme that i've talked about on the show in fact for those of you who have been longtime listeners i brought this up in february i wrote a story about it in forbes and i talked about it after the siakam trade siakam's going to demand more money tyrese halburn's getting a huge raise aaron neesmith's getting a small raise and all of a sudden that is going to dry up a lot of space and that's what happened so the pacers have this tax reality that you all know about you've either heard it or seen it tweeted or seen it written about there's going to be some estimating going on and so i apologize for those of you that don't necessarily find this stuff the most interesting but i think it's very revealing of what the rest of their free agency is going to look like they currently have 14 players either on a contract or with an agreed to contract or johnny furphy who it's not an agreed to contract but it's going to happen whether it's you know, a, a, a whatever kind of standard deal it is. Players picked in the mid-30s get standard contracts. So if you estimate Johnny Furphy's deal, as I have, starting at about 1.8 or 1.85 million, and then you fill in Pascal Siakam's max, Obi Toppin's deal starting as low as it possibly can and still reaching $60 million in total, and James Wiseman at the minimum, which here's here's what some differences could be. Perhaps Obi Toppin has some bonuses or incentives that make his value actually start lower and means 4 for 60 is reported a little bit inaccurately, right? That's that's one possibility that would make my numbers off of reality, right? James Wiseman could have some funky guarantees that we don't know about, right? Um, his deal is almost certainly a minimum deal given the Pacers' current tax reality, but that is not officially known in any capacity. And Furphy could start at a lower number than what I just said. So they are they have some wiggle room of some kind below the tax, but it's not a lot, right? So how do they proceed from here when they only currently have 14 players? From a rules perspective, they could be fine. They could just so check, this is our team. 14 is enough. You're allowed to carry 14 permanently. Um, that's fine. If you have 13, every, after two weeks of having 13, you have to uh, sign someone new for for 10 to 4. I can't remember if it's 10 or 14 days. We have to sign someone new for a while and then you can go back to 13. But at 14, you're good and you can have 15 plus your two ways. So the reason it matters that the Pacers are potentially the tax pending all that stuff I just said about Obi and about Wiseman and Furphy, you know, is it's hard to fill it, fit in that 15th guy, even a minimum where they're paying the, the minimum cash to a player and the league's reimbursing the rest gets them very close. And close sounds fine. You're under. Great but it makes it hard to make a trade, right? If you're making a trade, you take back more salary, all of a sudden you're over, uh-oh, you got to figure it out, right? You don't want to have to deal with that. You like the flexibility if you can get it. Of course, still making the right moves. The other thing this doesn't account for is bonuses, incentives. I haven't talked about this much, but this matters a great deal to the Pacers. One, this is the reason they're closer to the hard cap than people keep saying. Um, the, the hard cap is about $178 million. I think the Pacers are about seven and a half million away because incentives have to count. You can't exceed the hard cap for any reason. So any unlikely bonuses a player has count towards that. I'm getting too into the weeds. T uh, Miles Turner has one and a half million dollars of total incentives in his contract. Now, all those are unlikely bonuses. He didn't hit any of them last year, but he has them. TJ McConnell has $400,000 of bonuses he didn't hit last year. So those count one towards the hard cap apron, which doesn't really matter for anything I'm about to say. But two, if you're thinking about the tax, you don't, if, if you're a team actually trying to avoid it, I'm not, I don't know what the Pacers are doing. On one hand, you could say, oh, well, we got to give ourselves enough room that if they get these bonuses, then great. We're, we're in the tax. You don't want that. You want to duck under that reality, right? That was part of the reason. If you, if you guys remember in 2022 at the trade deadline, I did a whole podcast on the day before the deadline. They had already acquired Halliburton. They traded away Carousel. I said, 
I still think they're going to make one more trade because there's a there's a chance that a couple of guys on their team hit bonuses that take them over the tax. Lo and behold, they traded Torrey Craig for Jalen Smith in what I viewed as a money saving move, and then Jalen Smith was great, or at least for what the expectation was. So you can you could look at bonuses now and say maybe they're done, right? They have about 1.9 million in bonuses. They're a little over two million from the tax. 14 players check. They they could. I don't want to say what the bonuses are. They're not really publicly out there, and what actually is publicly out there, I, I believe, is wrong. Um, but I would ca- I would characterize them as this as something that if it happened, the Pacers would be happy to pay it and potentially pay the tax. Like they're very lofty uh, incentives for both players. So maybe they're willing to get a little snug with the tax because the reality where these hit is not a big deal. All of this matters, though. I bring up their current financial reality to say. If they want to add a 15th player, they could. They could do that and be under the tax, but they'd have to think about incentives in a way that might scare them away from you know, going all in on someone who's going to have guaranteed money. They'd probably want a non-guaranteed contract for their 15th spot if they're going to add a 15th guy, and they've had lots of guys on non-guaranteed contracts to start seasons. Lots of guys, year after year, right? James Johnson had non-guaranteed two years ago, so did Langston Galloway, but they cut him uh, coming out of camp. They had some guys last year before they were at the, they bought out Daniel Tice. They had the roster spot to get James Johnson on another non-guaranteed deal coming into the season. O'Shea Brissett was on a non-guaranteed deal. Keelan Martin was on a non-guaranteed deal. Uh, I've got to be missing. I mean, they, I could go back for years. Someone on their team has very typically had one, and that opens up a lot of flexibility ahead of the league-wide guaranteed contract date in January, right? So you can cut them then, save your money, you're good. And so that is what they can easily afford. But the key to all this is Kendall Brown. Kendall Brown is currently on a non-guaranteed contract. But as I talked about earlier and why the basketball part matters so much, does not project to have a role or even like handed young guy minutes, right? If there is an opening for minutes for some reason, garbage time, blowout game, injury at the three or four, even the two, Jairus Walker and Johnny Furphy, to me, would be in line before him. So what is the path for him to play minutes? And what is the reality where he is a guy that they're prioritizing? Maybe he can play in the G League. And I like a lot of the, the traits Kendall Brown has. He's so athletic. He's definitely the fastest guy on this team, right? He, he's definitely gotten a lot better since they got him. $2.1 million cap hits really low. It's non-guaranteed until opening night. And the reason that that matters is they can keep him through summer league. He's on the summer league roster. No surprise. And in a training camp, see if he looks amazing, see if he's worth sticking around, and then decide then. But he might want to try to find a deal now or something like that. Um, so how he plays in summer league is going to really matter here. But they can, a veteran minimum contract is cheaper from a cap hit perspective than Kendall Brown's deal. Barely, but still it is. So that matters to me, right? If you're the Pacers and you're like, man, we could save a little bit here, they might consider doing that. And so if you want to see the Pacers either try to add a veteran like stabilizing something that's like a two, three and can handle the ball in a pinch. I would keep an eye on Kendall Brown for that. And if you want to see the Pacers keep James Johnson, because he's been this awesome bet. I haven't listened to this podcast yet. I really need to. Uh, Alex Golden and, and Fachi had Aaron Neesmith on setting the pace. And I saw comments about this before I left for this trip I'm on right now under the tweet about his, an answer he had about James Johnson and how great he is as a teammate. I wrote a whole story on this before. Like dudes love having him around. Um, you know, if they, if you want the Pacers or think he has value on the team, uh, the best way for him to get a roster spot or the most easy and obvious way would be a waiver of Kendall Brown. That doesn't solve any of the basketball problems from the previous segment, problems, air quotes, but it does give them something that's clearly given them basketball value in seasons past in terms of having a vet who provides all sorts of intangible things. So if it's James Johnson, they could want it, something like that. And then also, if you save a couple hundred thousand bucks, a little less than that, or a little over that, excuse me, by, by moving on from Kendall Brown and bringing in a veteran minimum guy on a non-guaranteed deal, you still would have room to, let's say, sign one of your draft picks to a rookie minimum deal. Uh, zero years of experience player, so, so non, an undrafted free agent or a second-round pick. Uh, their minimum salary in year one's really low because they haven't played, right? So Tristan Newton or Enrique Freeman, they would have really low cap hits. And they would fit with another vet or even with Kendall Brown and keep the Pacers under the tax and far enough away that the incentives probably wouldn't burn them um, unless Miles Turner had like an absurdly incredible season, which is not out of the realm of possibility. So all of that to say, if you think what I said in the first segment is accurate about the Pacers basketball situation, they need to add maybe one of those skills I said, or just look at, look at the balance of it. 
then they could do it with Tristan Newton, but he's a rookie. Is that actually something they want to rely on? Uh, from a ball handling perspective, they could get shooting in lots of ways. They could get leadership from James Johnson. They can do all that stuff, but financially it's tight and it gets less tight if Kendall Brown is waived. And another way to potentially do it is with an undrafted rookie, but that is not helping you with proven skills. That's just helping you have a 15th player to have a 15th cheap player. Not sure that that's necessarily something they're dying to do, but it is a possibility as they kind of lunge forward. Um, so that's their financial reality. That's some ways they can skirt around it and, and think about their bonuses. And that is until they sign something the last time you'll have to hear me talk about cap stuff, but uh, it could change, right? I have tried, but have not heard anything concrete about the structures for Toppin or Wiseman. So I could be a little bit off, which would matter potentially a great deal, as you can tell with how thin these margins are to the Pacers ability to build their team. Uh, I'll try to get that out when I can, but a lot of the stuff could become official as soon as, uh, tomorrow, and that would be a day that you'd hear more about this stuff anyway. So as it stands for the Pacers, I would not expect anything grand outside of, you know, if they made a trade in the next couple days, and I'm looking forward to seeing how they build it out. So it'll be fascinating to watch that. Now we pivot to the other part of free agency, stuff other teams have done that I like and would have at least thought about as the Indiana Pacers and moves involving ex-Pacers players, which is always fun to track for some and less fun to track for others to close out today's show. And we're back here on Lockdown Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Jump on over to let me let me think of some of the teams I would consider winners of free agency. The Warriors are actually doing a very good job. We'll talk about them in a second. The Mavs, I think, have done a good job. The Sixers, I think, have done a good job. The Knicks have done a really good job. They've been very clever. Um, that's, I think, my favorites so far. I'll do losers next time I tell you guys for second listens. But I like those teams. Go check out their shows to hear about the state of their realities. You've heard the Pacers' reality. They've kept their own guys largely. The only flip and flopping is James Wiseman in for Jalen Smith. We talked about that two podcasts ago and a little bit with Derek Schultz yesterday, if you want more on that. I think it's a fun bet. James Jalen Smith out. The you lose one 2020 draft pick that you made better. Now you try again with James Wiseman. I love the, the chances of the Pacers trying to do that. Once again, uh, let's look at free agency up. Uh, elsewhere uh i have i just keep a list of stuff that i liked that happened fireworks going off outside excuse me for looking away uh and so i can relay them uh, in a second we haven't gotten any news or rumors or reports or whatever about the pacers what they might be considering moves they could be making so let's run through some moves involving x pacers some moves i liked elsewhere and then get you guys out of here enjoy your weekend uh one isaiah joe's contract with the thunder is awesome <laughs> Um, and there's no way he was ever leaving. I believe he was a restricted free agent with OKC. I'm not 100% sure, but they clearly declined his team option knowing they would have a chance to keep him. I think he signed for four for 48, so $12 million a year. That dude can really shoot. Underrated defender, sub-MLE deal, most likely. I suppose it could be structured differently given that they have cap space, but I think that contract is awesome. There's no chance he would have ever come to the Pacers given the Thunder situation, but Oh, man, that's a great contract and one that if the Pacers could have, given their financial realities in future seasons, would be an incredible get for them in trades. And that will be something we talk about on a show next week because you guys will see why I think that matters. Uh, Kelly Oubre, I'm lower on him than the consensus of just like everyone in terms of players and their talent level. But at, at two years, $16 million to $8 million a year, that's a really good deal. That's the room exception. In theory, that would have fit to the non-tax mid-level. That would not have fit for the Pacers currently under my projections of their salaries under the hard cap, but that's a good contract at his ability level. Sixers have had an unbelievably strong uh, offseason, and I think that, that that is one of the deals that I think is very good. Even beyond Paul George, they've done a really good job. Kyle Anderson at 3 for 27 I really liked. We talked about him a lot on the forward pre preview episodes of Free Agency, uh, and he, he made some sense for the Pacers as like a defensive wing, but I don't think his speed would have – really kept up with this team and you know at, at nine million a year he, i think he's made between eight and a half and nine million a year for like eight straight seasons uh, or something crazy that's one i liked since the last time we talked about contracts gary harris at two for 15 i think that's a good deal for the magic surprised that the nuggets didn't push for that in some sort of sign and trade with kcp i just don't get anything the nuggets have done this offseason i get why they're gonna say they didn't do the stuff they did it's just very very weird to me uh dalon right to the bucks on a minimum 
That's not necessarily a deal I think the Pacers should have been all over because they don't have room to play guards. He's a great defender, though, and the Bucks really needed someone exactly like that. At least well, that would be my uh, diagnosis of their struggles as the Pacers tore up their guards in the postseason and throughout the regular season often. I think he's going to be really good for them. I think that's a, a signing that the Pacers should keep an eye on uh, as the season progresses because the Bucks needed a player exactly like that, and they got one uh, in Dale Wright. I think that's going to be – a really, really, really good fit for them. Um, some ex-Pacers that have done some stuff. Bruce Brown, his team option got picked up. Good for him. Uh, he agreed to that deal with the Pacers last year, and there was some value to, to an obvious trade uh, early on in that process, right? I mean, we talked about Jimmy Cook and I did our – when he did our What are the Odds show last year, we did an odds one of Miles Turner, Bruce Brown, and Buddy Heald are traded last season. We both said over 50%. Two of them were, and Bruce's tradable contract was a key part of him being a part of the biggest trade that the Pacers made. Uh, but I did not know what his option would look like. But every his option got picked up, and immediately the newsbreakers who broke it were like, yeah, this could be dealt this season. I think Bruce Brown pretty certainly a lock to get traded or not finish this season with the Raptors, a very clear buyout candidate uh, if he doesn't get traded. And then you might see some apron rules come into play if he does get bought out. Um, Kyle Mangus, very, very few of you might remember him. He played. He signed an Exhibit 10 and had one practice day with the Pacers last year in training camp, and then he spent the season with the Indiana Mad Ants. Uh, he made the G League All-Star game. He's from Warsaw. Really could shoot it. Uh, he is playing with the Lakers for Summer League. Uh, Xavier Johnson from IU is playing with the Mavs for Summer League. Lance Jones from Purdue with the Pacers. Zach Eady, obviously, with the Grizzlies. I think that's all the local guys that – I can remember off the top of my head. Dakota Mathias with the Pacers, too. That'll be fun. We'll talk more about Summer League next week. Uh, Buddy Heald, his new home after Philly, uh, is he is headed to the Golden State Warriors. A lot of very interesting dead days leading up to reporting on that. Uh, it sounds like he'll get a four-year deal with some funky guarantees in the last two seasons, a player option at the end. It's a good way for him to get guaranteed good money if it doesn't go well, but still have a chance to do free agency again. Um, remember the Pacers wanted to extend his deal, right? That was a huge subplot less than 12 months ago. He was making almost 20 million at the time. Very rarely do guys extend for less. Um, so interesting that that is how this all shook out for Buddy Hill. That it, it got tough for him given the way it ended in Philly. And the Golden State's a good fit for him. The Warriors have done a good job pivoting off of Clay Thompson, but Buddy Hill, Splash Buddies instead of the Splash Bros now in Golden State. Looking forward to seeing how he fits there. I will, I wonder how that backcourt will shake out. I love the D'Anthony Melton pickup for the Warriors, too. That's all for the news elsewhere that I liked that I didn't cover the first time I did this and ex-Pacer news for free agency. If I ever do another free agency show, you will get more of these just off the cuff, random Tony thoughts, plus former Pacers uh, on the move. So guys who either their last team was the Pacers or they were on the Pacers last year. Uh, we're getting close to extension time, so we'll talk about some of that stuff next week. We are getting close to Summer League time. We'll talk about Summer League next week. I want to do an entire show looking ahead at 2025's offseason, and that might sound stupid, but when I do it, you'll go, oh, wow, I'm glad I thought of, I'm glad I learned that information because you trust me, you'll see. Uh, so lots of fun stuff coming here on Lockdown Pacers. Hope you all had a great fourth, and if you're off for the fifth, because a lot of people are doing that for their holiday weekend structure, enjoy your long weekend, have some fun with family, be safe. It's a very fun time of the year. We'll be back Monday, and less news breaks over the weekend, and of course we'll be all over that. But we'll be back Monday talking – Something, either free agency, summer league stuff, uh, team update stuff, off-season trades, extensions, whatever, as it comes. Thank you all for listening today. Have a wonderful day. See you very soon.